Ferry? Transport. Transport. And, and, uh, yeah. Well, in English you have etc. Et cetera. And others. And other things. But et yam is et plus yam, which is already. Yam is already. Uh, you know the French phrase in English, déjà vu? Déjà vu. Déjà is from, is from Latin yam. Yam. J A M. So, um, now in the final, uh, in the second book of uh, the Aeneid, Aeneas, Aeneas, this is too loud. This is too loud. I have an echo that comes into my ears, yes. So, in, in the book two of the uh, Aeneid, you might remember that poor Aeneas has come very destitute, almost naked, you know, etc., etc. And the gracious queen, Dido, she has given him everything, including her beautiful body. Hmm? Uh, but she is wanting to listen to a story. There's no free lunch. <laughs> I want your story. I'm interested in your story. She's delighted, you know, in listening. <laughs> She's a listener. So uh, that's why he says, uh, Renovare dolorem jubes regina. My queen, you want me to renew my pains. Nevertheless, I shall tell you how it did happen. So he described the horse and, uh, and the fears of the Trojan. And then he says, he underlines the lack of courage by Achilles. Here, savage Achilles pitched his tent, tents. No more. They have, fled. They, they, they have fled away. Over there, the armada moor, and here the family, etc. So there's nothing except the horse. Uh, yes. One second, I have noted it down. After, you see, the, uh, the horse has been opened by some traitor. Mm -hmm. I mean, there is always a villain. Yeah. And the villain is a Greek who pretended to side with the Trojan. Yeah. Hmm? And after that, uh, the, uh, the father of Aeneas and then even... Uh, uh, the, the priest of Troy says, O light of the Trojans, last best hope of Troy, what's held you back so long? How long we've waited, Hector, for you to come, and now from that far shores? How glad we are to see you, we battle-weary men, and after so many deaths, your people dead and gone after your citizen, your city felt such pain. But what outrage 
has mutilated your face so clear and so cloudless once. So, wasting no words, no time on empty question, having a deep groan from his heart, he calls out, Escape, son of the goddess. Tear yourself from the flames. The enemy holds our walls. Troy is toppling from, its, from her eyes. You have paid your debts to our king and native land. If one strong arm could have saved Troy, my arm would have saved the city. Now, into your hands, she entrusts her holy things, her household gods. Take them with you as comrades in your fortunes. You see, uh, there is a justification of uh, Aeneas running out, mm. Mm? even in Homer. Mm. But Virgil stresses on it. Yeah. And, and uh, uh, somehow he yeah, yes, he, 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 he tries to make, to write history while we are not sure at all of what happened. You have to know that in Virgil times there were many, many versions of uh, Aeneas' stories. Yes, that, that was not the only one. But he's been very skillful. And uh, uh, to come back to our uh, Portuguese poet, um, he compared himself with Virgil and also with Aeneas. Virgil had never been uh, a soldier, but Camus, yes. And yesterday I failed to give you a good account of uh, Camoes life, it's quite interesting, quite, quite revealing. He, uh, he was born in 1524. At the moment he was born, his mother died. So he says in one of his poems that uh, I was born under a black star. Five years later, he lost his father. So you have to remember that he was, of course, from a noble family, but a minor branch of a noble, noble family. And when I read a bit about him yesterday night, I saw, you know, that what the Portuguese, even today, what they say about his ancestors, they are somehow silent about his mother. Eh, eh. Everything about the, the father, etc. But the mother and the grandmother, they are not so praised. Hmm? So it explains many things. He was not at ease with the high aristocracy. He was despised. And he went uh, at the age of uh, uh, at the age of twelve years, he uh, entered Coimbra, the university. It is the main university of Portugal, and in those days, Coimbra has just been founded better say, refounded, from Lisbon was transferred to Coimbra to be out of the reach of the church. We are in Renaissance times. And there is, in the whole of Europe, a quite uh, a spirit of criticism, a new approach to classical text that were being bring brought, that were being brought from Constantinople that has fallen under the Turks, and also people, they, uh, you see, 
they needed something new because during the whole of Middle Ages, there was nothing but the Bible. There was nothing but the Bible in Latin, controlled by the church. People did not even have access to it. Yes, it was only through the priest. Who, they would read some passages and that's all, be happy. Hmm? So, uh, they, uh, when they discovered that the Greeks in Constantinople had totally other visions of Christianity, that they had kept a Roman and Greek heritage, that also through the Arabs, because the Arabs were immensely prestigious, even if they had lost their European empire almost, they were immensely prestigious because they had been the first in opening universities, real universities in Europe, in, in, in Spain, and they had been copied everywhere. And you see, when, they, when people were able to read Arabic, they said, oh, but they, they knew Greek before us. Oh, they, they, they are not embarrassed with uh, Aristotle's theory, you know, because the church would say, oh, you see, in the Greek philosophy, there are, among the Greek philosophers, some of them, they are in total con contradiction with our Christian faith. So they should not be read. The Arabs, I don't say the Muslim, I say the Arabs also, they were not embarrassed. You know, they would read any text. They would translate any text. And so did people in Constantinople because they were opposed to the Church of Rome. I would like to, uh, to stress one thing that had become quite important in the Renaissance and with Protestantism, that is, uh, where's my pen? Ah. Iconoclastia. Uh, in Persian, it is But chicken. Iconoflas. So, Reggie, thank you. Iconos is uh, an image, a holy image. Classed, you remember. Perhaps the English clash, crash, breaking image. The Persian, they had that notion since always also. And we are talking of 6th century BC. At the moment, Islam comes also. And it's an unknown fact that iconoclastia was a movement against statues, against pictures of deities in the whole of Asia Minor, Minor. even in some part of Persia. Uh, it's very strange. And, and uh, uh, when the French, Italian, Portuguese people discovered that there was a school of thought still among the Greek Christians against images, saying that is paganism. So, you see, they started putting question. You have here one of the roots of the Renaissance critical spirit. 
that finally landed into Protestantism. So they, uh, uh, this is one example of being capable of questioning the official stand of the Catholic Church. And there are many others, like the apparition of zero. When the Portuguese started conquering harbors in, in Asia, uh, almost everywhere, they became so filthy rich. You see, uh, they, they were using the Latin system, so this was one, this was hundred, this was thousand, and after thousand, they had nothing. They would write Kentum Milia, hundred hundred thousand, but that was already almost unthinkable. The Indians had millions since a long, long way. Because they had the zero. And the Arabs had developed the zero and also algebra. Oh, you know algebra. You know what? You must have studied algebra, no? Yeah? And Arabic, al jabbar means the powerful. <laughs> An algorithm. An algorithm. Algorithm hmm? yeah. uh, for uh, using your computer. Yeah. It's from Arabic alwardian, alwardian, etc. So uh, the Europeans discovered that uh, through the Arabs who also had known the Indian way of counting and the zero, they discovered that, oh my God, they have such a powerful way of counting, and they have even negative, the Arabs, they have negative figures. How could this be possible? And the church says, no, nature does not tolerate emptiness. Therefore, you cannot have emptiness in the creation, because creation is the word of God, and God cannot negate himself. See? <laughs> so, for a moment, the church was against renewal of science through new mathematics. That was also part of Renaissance. It came first through economic needs. But then, you see, they, they had to just abandoned because they, they, the, the church in Rome, they would not be against millions of coins after all. And finally they discovered that yes, okay, we, we can use this system. But don't touch the calendar. And then, you see, when you realize that in the Roman calendar, in the Christian calendar, there was never any zero, Huh? There was no year zero? You celebrated the 1,000 year, but not the year zero? So the whole thing, the whole thing is wrong. They tried to, you know, to sort of patch up and they create uh, a new calendar. So that was very difficult. With the new numbers, hmm? But that has put people in immense doubts against the all-knowing church. See, in the, the Renaissance movement is uh, all about that. It's, it's confronting new worlds, new ideas, and a huge criticism. So young Camoens, he is confronted with that when he comes to the new University of Coimbra. Hmm? So he's not an idiot, you see. When his uncle, he, he goes out of the university, he's between 17 and 18, we don't know exactly. He had an uncle who protected him because he, has, he was an orphan. And the uncle said, all right, my boy, you've 
done your universities, now do your duty, you are not a very high noble, become a priest. Louis, young Louis says, no, to hell with you. I don't want to become a priest. So what is left? Army. <laughs> so for a moment, he went to the court and on the pretense of joining the, there was a school for cadets or for, you know, not very much rich young people, but still belonging to the so-called nobility. Many of them was converted Muslims and Jews, many of them. That uh, allowed the Portuguese king, king to create two schools in the years 50, 1530, they had created two schools for young cadets from the nobility. There was one school for Africa, one school for, for Asia. And especially people who had come from converts family, they had many of them. They have some knowledge of Arabic, which was very useful. Although they pretend not to know. So, uh, it is in this context that young Louis comes back to the court with the pretext of, you know, someday enlisting in the army. But for some years, he, he goes to the court, he goes to the places where uh, there were everyday sarao, Sarao means a festival, evening festival, Sarao. And that was also a new, new thing, you see? Uh, Sarao. It comes from a, an, a root that means the evening. So the, he would go to the Sarao of the most I would say uh, progressive people, so, somehow, women, they had circles of women who would dare to sing, dance, compose poetry, which was a new thing, you know, Renaissance times also. So there he was, a, he was a very handsome young man, very gifted, so he started writing poetry. He started writing poetry just like Virgil did. did. He started writing eglogs. That is um, uh, poetry about nature, you know, about uh, rustic. Uh, can I close the door? And. Uh, he would not publish his poetry for a book, a good reasons, a good reason that his poetry is like Virgil's first poetry, is like Latin poets, you know, it was a very light poetry and sometimes not very decent, I mean, in the eyes of the church. Remember, he had refused to be a priest. So he dared to fall in love with a princess who was directly uh, related to the king, Katarina de Ataide, that is in 1543. He's in his 20s. And uh, openly, he writes poem dedicated to her. The problem in the court, you know. So the family of Ataide, uh, Ataide is with A-T-H-A-I-D-E, Ataide. So the family was incensed and above all, you see, all right, he could pretend to marry the princess. He has, of course, he's a young noble, but look, he, he has got no money, first thing. Second thing, we don't know very much about his mothers and sisters what the Portuguese used to call limpeza de sangue, the 
cleanliness of your blood. Hmm? <laughs> so that was a big problem because nobody could really prove something. They used to pay notaries to write fake genealogies. If you had money, you would become a great noble. Hmm? Especially after the end of the Muslim domination, everybody pretended to come from, you know, <laughs> from the north of France, from the Vikings, from whatever. <laughs> yeah, Greek. So, uh, Louis de Camões, he could not prove anything, and he was sent for exile on the Rivaterge. Do you remember we talked about the tigers, the big, big flower, big uh, river? that comes from Spain yeah. and comes into Lisbon, the Tagus. Yeah. Tejo in Portuguese, Tejo. Yeah. Spanish Tajo, mm -hmm. Portuguese Tejo. Yeah. Written almost the same, but as you see, <laughs> they, <laughs> they talk at cross purposes. So he was sent in the country, uh, back in the, somewhere in the country, uh, um, 100 kilometers from Lisbon, perhaps. And there, he did not stop writing poetry. He continues. But then he managed to be pardoned and come back to the court. Then, again, there is a very strange episode in his life. You see, I have been reading yesterday different accounts of uh, Camoens' life, which I photographed from my books uh, back in France. So one book I have is 1807. In that book, there is absolutely no mention of his quarrel during a religious procession. In 80 years later, when Portugal for a short time became almost a republic, then they do mention that uh, Louis de Camões, during a holy procession, what we call Corpus Christi, that is the body of Christ, it's a huge procession with big images and whatnot, songs in Latin, and etc., children, you name it. Hmm? Angels, real angels etc. Hmm? So there is Camoens looking at the procession. He doesn't take off his hat. And worse of it, you see, there was a young man from the court who was bearing a big statue. You know? So he mocks him. And they fight. So <laughs> that's a terrible thing. He's sent to jail. Immediately. Hmm? Now, this shows his spirit. He's a rebel. And he only comes to writing things in favor of the king, not in the church. In his whole writings, we have nothing in favor of a particular saint. No, no. Greek heroes, yes. Greek, uh, Greek gods, Latin gods, yes. Portuguese heroes, yes. Catholic church, Catholic saints, no. <laughs> None of them. <laughs> See? Uh, so he uh, he's back to, to jail. I mean, he's going in, in the jail for three years. Three years of real jail. The Inquisition is not yet very strong, but it is the beginning. Uh, in Spain and Portugal, especially Portugal, the Inquisition shamelessly came from France. And in 1535, it was becoming powerful. We are in uh, 1550. But still, you see, the king, he is needing those young people, he is needing that new knowledge for navigation, etc., geography, and even the geography of the Arabs is very useful 
because they had been good navigators. So the, the, the king, he is not going to say to the church, all right, we abandon all those things. They, 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 they are not very saintly. No, no, no. He doesn't give a free ride to the church. But in this case, in the case of disturbing a procession, well, there is no pardon. He is in the jail for three years. And what does he do in the jail? Writing poetry. And, you know, the king, uh, the king is a bit uh, embarrassed because he needs people like him to go to war. Because they don't want stupid people to become commanders. Hmm? Even if they, are, if they have their own critical thinking, at least they are educated. So finally the king agrees for him to go to, to war to Africa. But as a punishment, he is sent as a simple soldier. Of course, he will come into higher grade very quickly. But in Ceuta, uh, Sipta in Arabic, in Ceuta is a town that almost touches Jebel Tariq, Gibraltar uh, in Spain, you know. So it's a very tiny strait of sea that separates the Mediterranean and the ocean. And there you have Ceuta. And uh, he fights bravely in Ceuta and loses one eye. When he comes back to Lisbon, again he has some problems because he did not stop write, writing and he did not write nice things according to the church. So, uh, in 1553, finally, after again one year in jail, uh, he is allowed to go to India, which he wanted very much because he knew that going to India, would become, he would become rich. Hmm? So the king says, well, let us get rid of him. At least he's a good soldier, could become a good captain. Well, the farest, the better. Hmm? And during his voyage to Goa in 1553, 1554, um, Normally, the sea voyage would take six months. And if you had missed the good monsoon, that it was one month more. You had to be, well, what, six months more, sorry. You had to be very, very careful. Hmm? So he's lucky he disembarks in Goa, and there he, he discovered covers that the captain, I mean the commander of Goa, the governor, in Latin, gubernator. Oh yes, by the way, once I told you about, I don't know, the importance of maritime vocabulary, even in politics. Gubernator is the one who holds, what do you call it? The oath. No, not the oath. No, the, the, what is it called? Oh, I've forgotten. Like no. ha, that is in Hindi, in English. The, oh, horse. not the horse. No, it's, I'm sorry. Well, uh, I hope you don't get old so quickly. Yeah? Well, he won't answer me anyway. So, rudder, rudder, merci, merci. The rudder. So, in Latin, guberna is the rudder. Gubernator is the one who 
holds the rudder in the good direction, is the pilot. So governor, in English, and in French, and in so many languages, comes directly from ship uh, techniques. You see? So that was just a parenthesis. Gobernator. <laughs> No, but you see. I I am not sure about that. I know my Latin etymology, and I know what happened in French and Portuguese and English. That was directly from the Latin word gobernator. Hmm? So the. Uh, I don't know. That I don't know. Uh, until I don't see a text, I don't believe it. You see, you have to give me a text. Then if you don't give me a text, you know, it's all hearsay. On maritime terminology. But yes, but well, that is another thing. Anyway, uh, uh, he has come to Goa and discovers, he has come with uh, the future governor, vice king. In, in those times, that was the viceroy, the vice king. He was also the governor. And uh, he, the governor happens to be his former commanders, commander from Ceuta, and they are friends. So for a moment, he's, uh, you know, a bit happy. Of course, he had been writing to be pardoned, you know, he had started writing his Luciadas on the ship, on the very ship, he started writing. So it's quite interesting that, you know, in the Luciadas, he talks so many, uh, so many times about the god Neptune, about the goddesses who helps or do not help the ship, etc., just like in the Odysseus. So he compares, compares himself with Homerus, Homer, and also with Virgil, with, uh, as far as the maritime aspect of, the, uh, of the, his epics is concerned. It's quite interesting that he starts writing at least 400 verses on the boat. On the boat. Hmm? Even, even when he's in Lisbon, on the boat, he starts his in invocation. Uh, it's like a prayer, starting, you know, like a pagan prayer, to the nymphs of the river Tegus. Uh, Virgil, he has a prayer to the muses, hmm? yeah. to the goddesses of poetry, etc. Uh, um, Camoens has a prayer to the uh, muses of the Tagus. He called them Tagides. Tagides. So, from the very beginning, he is on an epic voyage and he writes it he, and sometimes he writes down what he has under his eyes mm -hmm. see the uh, so he thinks himself as both homer and virgil virgil uh, he, but coming back to uh, to goa coming to to goa then then he changes subject because he discovers that the viceroy is his friend and they have festivities, etc. He participates in two military expeditions, comes back again wounded, but, but the governor and the, the viceroy changes and the new one 
is somebody who does not like at all his family. Still, he provokes him. He writes a small poem uh, against the Portuguese people at Goa, a satire, and makes a comedy out of it. A comedy deriding the Portuguese society in Goa. That is unforgettable. That is unforgivable, of course. So he is sent to exile, guess where? Macau in China, as far as possible. And he is, uh, that is, uh, that is in 1558, after two military campaigns, successful, instead of being, uh, of being rewarded, because he has again written a satirical comedy. Hmm? You see, you should not think either it, uh, Virgil or uh, Camões, they are not the author of a single big work. No, no. Virgil has written many, many poems that are not epic at all. And so did Camões. And he would like to write comedies just like the Latin writer would like comedy, would write satirical comedies. He did that. And of course, he's sanctioned. And he's sent to Macau. And he's given a, a cushy job. I'll give you exactly the title of the job because it's quite, uh, quite funny. Um, he is Provedor Mor de Difuntus e Ausentus. Uh, uh, no, 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 I will do it. Oh, yes, it's here. Thank you. So, <laughs> Provedor mor de difuntos e ausentes. It's a very cushy job. He's the a major provider and translating literally. More is major. You see, in Portuguese, very often a middle consonant disappears. Major becomes more. Provider, a major provider for defunct and absent persons. <laughs> See, actually, he is looking at money that has no more owners. So this is a very nice job. <laughs> and he is all alone in Macau in his uh, office. And what does he do? Right. Well, according to the legend, he goes to a cave, retires there, and uh, finishes his uh, Lusiadas. Again, again. More is major. Major provider of defense and absence. So he's looking after the money of people who disappeared, who, who died. Hmm? Very, uh, very easy job, actually. 
dead. Oh, oh sorry. Uh, all right. Uh, I willfully, you know, made a, as literal as possible translation. Thank you, Sushant. So uh, his friend, the governor, Francisco Barreto, uh, has gone away, and now he, uh, he has a new, go there is a new governor, and he is again in a bad, uh, when he comes back from Macau, because eight years, you see, normally he's sent for twice four years. Eight years is a maximum. He has to come back. But then his com coming back is very bad because he is brought back to Lisbon, uh, sorry, to Goa as a prisoner in chains because they make again a play to uh, a case, a legal case against him saying, oh, you made so much of money. That might have been true. But who wouldn't in those days? Who wouldn't? So he was brought in chains back from Macau to Goa, and then again put in trial and in jail for at least one year. He manages to escape, goes on a Chinese, uh, uh, Chinese boat with the idea of going back to China, you know, something. But unfortunately, unfortunately, the boat has, there is a shipwreck. So you can imagine if you have one eye and you are holding your manuscripts on the <laughs> other hand and <laughs> swimming like that. So legend has it that he landed on a beach in Cambodia Somewhere like that. <laughs> it's a beautiful legend. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But somehow he managed to uh, keep his uh, Lusiadas. All his money was confiscated, by the way. He had to borrow money to come back, and then he went to Goa again, and then borrowed money and went to Mozambique. <coughs> but since he was without money, nobody would offer him a passage. Then a chronicler, Portuguese chronicler, Diogo do Cauto, went to his help and said, OK, you can travel with me up to Lisbon. So finally, he comes to Lisbon. And then uh, he has, his poem is totally ready. Now, you remember? that a poem is, first of all, an epic poem, is, first of all, a political necessity. Yeah. And he had written this poem, first of all, to save himself, and secondly, to, you know, to please the, the, the king and make, and, and gain a pension. Mm -hmm. This is how a court poet would function normally, the world over, yeah. by the way. So, First, the first thing he does, he has just landed. He writes an ode. An ode is a long poem dedicated to somebody. Hmm? He writes a long, writes a long ode dedicated to the king, and of course, the king is very pleased to listen to his Lusiadas. So, he is allowed by the church. Because the king, you know, he needs this kind of uh, glory and he has nobody around to, you know, the Spaniards are threatening. His dynasty is in a bad shape. He has bad reputation. So uh, he needs a, a big poem for him. He needs a kind of, you know, uh, I would say literary statue. So the church obeys the king and he is allowed to publish, and he is given 10 years pension. We are talking of 
1571. He dies in 1580 without money because he had to give back so much of money he had borrowed. And when he dies, his widow pleads, pleads because there is no money to bury him. And it took 200 years to, uh, after uh, uh, there was a, an earthquake in Lisbon, in 1778, if I'm not wrong, a big earthquake, and the little church he was buried in was crumbled. So they managed to recover his rest, and in the, in, at the end of 19th century, they decide, when they uh, renew the ro royal system, you know, after the French Revolution anyway, they decide to have a big tomb for him, but very, very late. I do not know when the Portuguese uh, decided to make his, uh, uh, his two first stanza. I don't know how they decided to make it the national anthem of Portugal, but it still is, still is. Salazar, perhaps. Uh, yes, yes. And also, uh, as the king just very briefly after Salazar, one of the seven disciples. And this again has a liturgicism, and the very nationalist liturgicism. He is buried by the side of Vasco da Gama. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. That is number one. And yes, I have seen it. In the cemetery, it was established by the Henry the Navigator. Yeah. Yes, yes. Yes, yes, and, and, and also there's another thing. Uh, I discovered that he was a far remote cousin of Vasco da Gama through his mother. And Gama, Vasco da Gama was born in Galicia, now Spain, very close to his family home. And by the way, when, uh, uh, you see, uh, Galicia has always been a bone of contention between Portugal and Spain. Spain gained Galicia in the 17th century, totally, definitely, while Galician language is almost Portuguese. And the most famous Portuguese people, Vasco da Gama, and some kings also, and uh, Camoes comes from what is now Spanish Galicia. And that was a bit embarrassing. Galego. Yeah. Yeah, in Spanish, Galiego, Portuguese, Galego. So it's, mm, yeah. So, so much for his life. You know, but I thought it was important to really have a, a frame of thought. Hmm? You have to think of Renaissance. You have to think of his own destiny. After all, he chooses his destiny. He chooses his destiny. And, and he wanted to resemble Virgil at the maximum. Virgil also was in trouble with the emperor before he would write his Aeneid. Yes, yes, yes. So, uh, uh, in history, I do not believe in coincidences, simply. In the history of literature, you see, he, as a young man, he had been so much taught about Virgil, about the Romans, about the Greeks. Hmm? He could not but become a rebel. He could not but after, for saving his skin, his skin become a court poet, a court poet. Now, you remember we talked about the value du Resterlu, the old man from the Resterlu. So we do have 
we do have uh, we have traces of his rebellious spirit in the uh, in Oslusiadas, in Oslusiadas. The value to Restolu is an old man who lectures Vasco da Gama before he goes to Asia and tells him, well, you are wasting the kingdom's resources while the Spaniards are threatening. Be content what we have from the Moors in Africa. Okay, that was the reconquest. All right. But the rest, no, don't go. And of course, Vasco da Gama does not, does not listen to him. But it is very interesting that he has inserted in his epics a character who is lecturing the would-be conqueror about the vain efforts to expand the so-called empire. See, th this is uh, uh, quite interesting. And uh, how much time is left, sir? 15 minutes. 15 minutes. So anyway, tomorrow we can talk about Clete, uh, about Avecletu. But uh, just I'll let you have a few. And tomorrow I hope to be able to give to you written points. Hmm? Oh. oh, sorry. Yes. Nazaranda. Oh. Now, what is in you do swarga? An Indian response to the Lusiades. Uh, uh, he's uh, the author. Is Ave Cleto Afonso. He's a retired professor of philosophy from Goa. He's of course of uh, Indian Christian descent but describes himself as a non-believer, but needing Hindu mythology for his own life. Uvaticinio du Swarga, so my friend uh, uh, Sushant, yes, can you give a brief definition of Swarga? Thank you. Thank you very much. Sir, we have a Sanskritist also in the house. He knows Sanskrit very well. This is not. Oh, oh, oh. So, uh, I stick to Portuguese and Persian, all right? <laughs> so, I'm telling that he can explain these concepts to his friends better than I can. Thank you. Yes. Uh, tomorrow, you are welcome to. Hey, I didn't hear I didn't hear of a single question from you. Khabardar. Yes, so tomorrow we will talk. We can have question and answer. Yeah. So uvatisinu du swarga. Vatisinu means I told you already, no, the prediction. Yeah. So I told you that in every epics you have a prediction. Because epics, you know, it's very astute. First of all, you start in the middle of the action. You don't start with the beginning. So people say, oh, what is he going to talk about? Who is that Aeneas? Who is that Luzu? Who is Gamma? So the poet says, wait, wait, wait. Now I'm describing, this is what I'm going to say. Now I'm describing what is happening now, which battle, etc." And then in the second book, there is a comeback a flashback, and then uh, he, you have the beginning of the history, and then within the history, 
at a chosen moment, you have a deity, a god, a goddess, whatever, uh, that predicts with what will happen after the action is finished. So, uh, there is always in epics, you see, uh, there is a retrospective, hmm? uh, a conspectus, a retrospective. You understand me? Retrospective? Yes. You have a retrospective of what has happened. You have the present situation of the hero in difficulties, by the way. And later on, you have some deity who consoles the hero and says, well, don't you worry, my child. Your descendant will become great kings. The tiny village that you have founded, that will become a big empire. Hmm? But the, the, the poet, he avoids describing the present empire is talking about. That would be, that would not be very astute because maybe things are not going very well. So you better say, well, this is the prediction. And in Virgil, Iron Age also, uh, the prediction goes very far away because Ionia, like uh, I read you a while ago, Ionia's is told, oh, you are going to be the founder of Rome. Oh, you are going to be, to be the founder of a race that is going to dominate the world. Oh, you are going to be the ancestor, like Venus, of the great emperors of Rome. Uh, in the Aeneid, that is told when Aeneas visits his father in the hell. His dead father is in the hells. Aeneas has a visit to the hells and then meets some dead people who tell him the future. And the, the reign of August is among the bright future. So we don't have a, a, a descent to the hells in the, uh, in the, uh, in the Lusiadas. But we do have, at some times, we do have a council of God, you, gods. You remember the image we saw? We have a council of gods who says, well, uh, the uh, Portuguese empire is going to last, etc. So this is what vaticinio means. And uh, um, Afonso does not uh, forget to say something. He says, Uke Lusiadas non canta. What the Lusiadas does not sing, I shall sing. So this is a, perhaps a clearer view. I don't know, I wish these lights, you know, this stupid light, I wish it would be off. I don't care much about the recording, but I care about what I present. So, uh, you see, in, in the cover of the book, you have the Swarga. You have the Council of the Gods. Now, remember the picture we saw from the Lusiadas 19th century edition? That is a tit for tat already. Now, what he says, I took the liberty of translating his Portuguese into English. That took me quite a lot of time because uh, I had taken very bad photographs of my book at home and I committed the stupidity of not bringing the book here. So when you have a bad photograph, you cannot scan very well and you have to guess sometimes the words. Uh, Uvaticinio du Swarga, what the Lusiadas do not sing. Ave Cleto Afonso, Goa, 2013. Isbos, 
Iz bosu means preliminary sketch. Iz bosu, the first part of it. Už luziadaš a gran epopeja du genial poeta, luzu, luis du camões, naturalmente, enche a alma do povo português, até por infundir um romanticismo maravilhoso na própria história de Portugal. The Lusiadas, the great apex of the genial luso Portuguese poet, Luís de Camões, naturally replenishes the soul of the Portuguese people. It's an Indian who spoke, who's speaking. Hmm? Even infusing a marvelous romanticism in the very history of Portugal. Then, you see, he hints at classical epics. A marvelous romanticism in the very history of Portugal. Marvelous means magic here. Thus enhancing the courageous adventure of such a small nation across great seas and unknown oceans. That is a direct quotation of Camões. Uh, and it's launching on a new maritime way to the Orient, the bard, Camões, the bard. The bard is the singing poet. The bard not only reflects the pride of his people, but above all, provides them with a just motive of boasting forever. See, there is a, a bit of criticism here. Enaltecendo a corajosa aventura de tão pequeno nação pelos grandes mares e oceanos desconhecidos e o lançar de um novo caminho marítimo para o Oriente, o bardo não só reflete, reflete o orgulho do seu povo mais, mas, sobretudo, proporciona um motivo justo para ele se ufanar eternamente. Uh, I uh, repeat this sentence because it is very important. Thus, enhancing the courageous adventures, an S is missing here, of such a small nation across great seas and unknown ocean, oceans, and it is launching a new maritime way to the Orient. That is quite ironic because now we know that it was not a new route. Now we know that the main pilots, one of them, the most famous one, was a Gujarati, Arabic-speaking Gujarati. Mm -hmm. The Bard not only reflects the pride of his people, but above all, provides them with a just motive of boasting forever. And, <coughs> infelizmente, para deixar passar desaparecidos não poucas consequências daquela glória de mandar, da vão cobiça luz para tantos outros povos distantes como os da Índia. And unfortunately, leaving unseen in the background so many consequences of that glory of domination empire, of that vain Portuguese avidity and for so many other distant not distant, it's distant people. Oh. Distant people, just like those of India. My underlying in red. Hmm? However, one should not see the Lusadas like a pure, versified Portuguese historical chronicle. Porém, non se deve ver os Lusadas com um registro da história pura. He is, Cleto, is excellent at Portuguese. And his choice of writing in Portuguese is very interesting politically. Whom is he talking to? He is talking to all those Asian people who still, still uh, speak and write Portuguese and telling them, well, don't be ashamed. That's a fact of history. But do not accept the Salazar fascist uh, 
lies, you know, do not accept the colonial propaganda that might come back any, any day. Porém, não se deve ver os Lusiadas como um registro da história pura. O seu valor, a sua beleza, estão mais na narrativa poética ingênua, nos artifícios da imaginação literária. Como tal, esta obra é aceita mere merecidamente como uma fina peça de literatura universal e bem pode tocar outras almas poéticas algures dando ensejo até para expressar com sentido a vibração as mágoas e os queixos das vítimas. Now, in Latin, there is a, a, a phrase. I hope you will have, you will use it. En cauda venenum. The poison is in the tail. <laughs> An allusion to the scorpion, you know? No. No. No, it's all right. You, you have a good up. Yes, but do not put any light because he is a good no, photographer. Ah, ah, oh yes. Oh yes. Yes, yes. Thank you, Sushant. Thank you. I'm not a practical person, I must admit. <laughs> so, uh, you see my text. However, one should not see the Lusiadas like a, poor, uh, a pure, versified Portuguese historical chronicle. Its value, is be its beauty, reside mainly in the genuine poetical narration, in the artifices of literary imagination, as such, this opus, this work, opus is a Latin work, eh? I choose here, plural is opera. As such, this opus, this work, is received deservingly as a fine piece of universal literature. So far, so good. As it may very well touch other poetical souls of other shores. And now comes the criticism. Now comes the venom, the poison, at the end of this paragraph, you know, in cauda venenum. At the end of the paragraph comes the hard criticism. Uh, as it may very well touch other poetical souls of all the shores to the point of inspiring the bitterness and the complaints of the victims. That is very astute of his. See? He is a good orator. And you have to be if you want to be at the very uh, height of uh, uh, Lusiadas. No, we can have a pause. No? You can have, but just so we can stop even from Yeah, stop. Uh, just one second now. Uh, I hope I have been clear. Now you have his intentions. Uh, just one more. Mm. Uh, I'm just going to write, read this, and tomorrow morning I'll read it again. The Vaticinio du Suarga, what the Lusiadas do not sing, is a modest literary effort, composed half a century after the end of Portuguese colonialism. You should remember that when Portuguese colonialism finishes, Portugal is under a fascist dictatorship 
which I knew myself. I have been in Portugal in the days of fascism, as well as in Spain, by the way. So I know what fascist dictatorship is about. Hmm? I was very young in those days, but I know. Uh, at the, after the end of co Portuguese colonialism on the sacred soil of India, in order to situate some parts of the Lusitanian apex in an oriental perspective, framing some episode, such as the council of the gods in the Olympus, the old man from the Reselu, the Adamastor, the monster, the Adamastor episode in the Hindu mythology, in the Hindu context, I add, instead of the occidental literary classicism, classicism of Camões based on Greco-Roman mythology. In order to inject the flux of oriental myst mysticism, widening the ambit of celestial decrees and destiny, vaticinio. So, widening the ambit of celestial decrees and destiny, as well as the field of mundane censure, like anticipating the cry of the peoples that were to be subjugated, as indeed they were. See, you have here, he has summed up what is Apex about. Now, we shall call it a day. Uh, oh, maybe I should leave it open. If you, if you have some remark while we are drinking tea, you can do that. Uh, please give me your name. Shivati Mishan. Okay. Um, and uh, you said that his wife had no money to bury him. His wife? Yeah. No, his family. No, he said his widow. Ah, his widow. Oh, yes, 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 yes. So, when did he marry? Huh. <laughs> I don't remember. And maybe I, uh, uh, maybe I said a stupid thing. I don't remember, because we do not know well about his end of his life. His last 10 years are all in mystery. We know he had some family. We know the family had no money. He died in a convent. So maybe I should have sent the family, not the wife. We do not know. Actually, we do not know. We know he had brought a slave an African slave with him. We know he had lived with a nation girl for quite a few years, and he wrote a poem about her, a long poem about her, that starts, Alma Minya Gentil, my so nice little soul. But, uh, this is all we know. Chai under la sake, no? Ah. Speak louder, speak louder. <coughs> yes. For me, I have no any background about ethics. Yes. That's why I cannot discuss. Yeah. And only told you in the ethics, unless you are which episode you are, but you see, but I can say stupid things, like I was not clear about his wife. He was very right. You know, and if there are things that you think that are absurd, just tell me. Because we are here to exchange ideas. So you say the idea the, of epics is totally uh, absent of you? 
You, uh, I mean, uh, have you read the Jatakas? Yes. Some, some Jatakas. Yeah. Uh -huh. I had to read hundreds and hundreds of English and Portuguese and Latin books in my long life. <laughs> so that makes a difference between us. I understand that. Yes. Thank you, sir. Yes, you see, that's why you shall be given, I hope so, <laughs> uh, a, a paper tomorrow. Hmm? To have a paper in your hand, it is very important. Sometimes a paper is handier than the, than the screen. Because, you see, a paper doesn't talk. <laughs> so, a, a paper, you can insult a paper, you can write on a paper, you can make your own opinion on it. And, hmm? So don't, don't you worry, uh, because uh, what I'm talking about here is the history of literature. And in my idea, epics is something quite universal. If you really think even in your language, your, your own language, there might be some epics. Now, anybody else who has something to say? Please do. No, somebody else? Somebody else. I would like to hear somebody else. Tomorrow you can talk again, but, but you see, I would feel better at ease if more people talk. Yes, you will have that tomorrow, anyway. Um, so, if, you know, if I come back, my, it, this might answer a bit of your question. But now, the concept of Orient and Oriental is something very funny. I belong to an institution that is the National Institute of Oriental Languages and Civilization. Now, this was very much a colonial heritage. And the people had decided that, what is Orient after all? Well, we shall say that Orient is whatever was under Ottoman power that we European reclaimed somehow and Oriental could include Africa and Asia because, because of the colonial tradition. Then something happened, you know, the fall of the wall in Berlin. For a moment we had the Eastern German, that was very very practical, Eastern German and the Western German. And all of a sudden, that crumbles. Now, uh, Occident is widening. And then someday, the Greek, they came into the European Union. 
And they said, oh, look at you. You have an institute in Paris of Oriental languages and there is Greek. We are, we are not an Oriental language. But then, <laughs> the Greeks are very much divided. The Greek Orthodox ch Church said, yes, we are Orient. We are Oriental Christianism. <laughs> and we had to have Greek both in both universities, in the general universities, without the mention of Oriental language, and Greek as Oriental language in the Oriental Institute. So we have both. And especially, uh, the, go the ministry says, now, in the Oriental Language Institute, there will not be ancient Greek. Now, it's also a bit of a problem. How on earth can you decide that there was no Orient in ancient times? <laughs> so, 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 it's a, it, it, it's a very much questionable, you know, it's a questionable thing. I do not have a ready answer. I'm sorry, I do not have. It, it's a, it's, it's a, for the moment, it's a European political problem. But you did very well in questioning that. You see, the, the, here, the Goan philosopher, he's talking in 2013, he's mocking at the concept of Orient. He writes it knowingly. It is irony. It is irony. Because in 16th century, uh, they would call as Indias. Uh, India was including China, including the whole of Western and Eastern Africa. So that was India. Of course, uh, in some ways they were right because they had Indians everywhere. In Madagascar, in uh, um, in Eastern Africa, you know, Indian population did not wait for uh, European colonialism to settle them. Of course, with European colonialism, Indians also came back. But much before that, they were there. So somehow, the Portuguese were using the term of Orient and India just like it was in the later Roman text. In the later Roman text, the very, in the in third century, you know, we have an Oriental Roman Empire and an Occidental Roman Empire. And that was used also, this concept was used and extended. Anybody else? What is your name, please? My name is Christine. Hmm. Uh, so I have uh, if I'm not mistaken, it is here. And then um, some Islamic invention like algorithma and algebra. But you also say that the first thing you do mathematics and algebra. So my question is on that time. No, it can speak slowly and, and louder, please. You're talking to somebody who's 76 years old. Islamic to exist or 
course, of course. Of course. No, it is not Islamic, it is Arab. Arab. Because you see, those Arab, uh, there were Christian Arabs also. There were Jew, Jews Arabic speaking also. There were Greek Arabic speaking also for a very, very long time. And, and when you have the Islamic expansion, I mean, this knowledge also expands. And thanks to trade, and thanks to um, even to wars, you see, in 16th century, when you have a war, you have so many exchanges. Then in 16th century, uh, European people, they realized that, oh, those people, the Hindus, the Muslim, whatever, they are so strong in mathematics. You see? They are, uh, we, we need that. So the, so the Renaissance people would think the church was totally against it. Like I told you, the very idea of zero was uh, understood as being blasphemy. While Jews, Muslim, Oriental Christians, Greek Christians, they wouldn't bother. Because, you see, the Oriental, even the Oriental Christian Church did not use Aristotle like the Western Christian Church did. So, uh, uh, when it appeared that all this knowledge was becoming very important for navigation, see, for uh, uh, reading the stars, for uh, precise geography, for new mathematics, for algebra, so, they realized that without that, well, first of all, the pilot couldn't work, and secondly, we uh, could not have good maps, and we can, could not calculate latitude if we don't have, don't have the idea of uh, negative numbers. You need negative numbers, no? So, uh, they, they, they said, well, we, we, we have to adhere by that. And that, even those very practical things, they came as a huge questioning of the official Catholic tradition. When, you, when somebody says, like El Greco, have you heard of El Greco, a famous painter who emigrated from Crete in Greece, the island of Crete. He emigrated to Spain where he could be paid after the fall of the uh, Oriental so-called Roman Empire, after the fall of Constantinople, and after his island was seized by the Ottomans, then he goes to Spain where there is a very powerful court, very rich, so he thinks I, I shall make fortune about it. It was not so in the beginning, because he dared to sign his uh, 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 his paintings. He would sign in Greek, Dominicos Theotokopoulos Epoye. That is epoye, by the way, just like epope, ep epopeia. Made, composed. Dominicos composed this. You know, and the church was wondering why he was representing Christ and the saint, saints in such a strange word. In such, in such a, a, a strange way also. He had colors that were not known in, 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 Europe, in, in Catholic churches until he really starts working 
for the nobility and painting the nobility, then he is accepted. And uh, uh, his uh, knowledge of Greek and his son also, his son became a very famous architect in 17th century Spain. Uh, they brought back so many theories of Greek architecture that were, that had been forgotten. And about the dome, you know, how to build a dome. That came back. Uh, have you heard of Hagia Sophia? Hmm? This a huge dome, one of the biggest in the world, dated from, if I'm not wrong, fourth century after Christ. And in spite of all earthquakes, did not budge of an inch. So El Greco, his son was an architect and uh, contributed to make big, big building in 17th century Spain using a knowledge that was unknown or lost. So the, the, the Renaissance was, uh, was a terrible revolution, terrible, a bloody one also. Because you have the religious wars, you know, the, the iconoclastia I talked about, that came about with the Protestantism. And Protestantism was a cause of very violent wars. It is, I was discussing it with Sushant, one of the reasons for 16th century France, even 17th century France, failed to write uh, epics while Portugal did. It is because we had such a bloody war, civil war between different religions. That, that means that uh, dynasties were fighting each other in the same country. So you don't have time really to build big epics. There were attempts. But those attempts, they failed. Yes, please, do. May I know your name, please? Yes, yes, yes. Rationalism. Uh, yes, and there is an uh, explanation uh, regarding to social uh, uh, events or, and wars, uh, which somehow uh, uh, put everything in question. So, as a reaction to that, there was a need to find or to build at least some certainty. Mm, not that much, but it was a necessity of finding a new way, <coughs> sort of rehabilitating the Renaissance. In that sense, yes. Uh, by the way, Descartes was very close to the Portuguese, uh, to, to the Portuguese, sorry, to the Portuguese Jews in, in Amsterdam. Mm -hmm. So he, he was very close to uh, 
the the family the the jewish philosopher no help me uh, in answer spinoza spinoza which is espinoza he was a portuguese jew so descartes came after him and borrowed from him and those ideas were very much close to renaissance and uh, um, so in a way descartes efforts were a kind of salvaging the renaissance criticism against the church giving a rational foundation not a mythical one you know descartes disputed the idea of soul that is a bit embarrassing <laughs> he disputed the idea whether animals could have a soul descartes had discussions with la fontaine and because la fontaine he borrowed fables from indians and greek etc giving animals a personality and for descartes there was no possible justification of animals having feelings because animals did not were not rationals therefore they could not have souls for descartes souls and reasons are very soul and reason are very closely linked you know his main demonstration so listen please it's very interesting how descartes justifies his idea of the human existence he says just imagine a jinn everybody knows what the jinn is huh just imagine a jinn is dreaming and i am the subject of the dream all things that are around me the whole world is the dream of a jinn how can you disprove me just try to say that the whole thing is not maya is not uh, see, uh, the imagine, imagination of some god how do we justify our existence so he says cogito ergo sum i think therefore i am so this is a, a saying that you know my rational spirit proves that i do exist of course you could challenge it <laughs> it's a but but it is a uh, it, it, it's a fantastic piece of reason after all it's a, <laughs> i mean uh, and uh, to some extent he uh, borrowed it from spinoza and of course the church did not like it but descartes was so much needed for the king and for the court because he was a good diplomat you know i was born 10 kilometers from his house by the way yes yes i'm not joking it is true the tiny village is called la edecart and i was born around 10 kilometers there but i never knew <laughs> It took me many years yeah and you are most welcome if you want to have some more uh, um, if you have some more questions <laughs>